innovation within a successful business model, that's is fairly new. It's a transformative, formative, cultural trend that has been referred to as the compassion effect. It's reverberating across society today at the box office, at the polls, and in the marketplace. And it's being driven in large part by the influence of the values and attitudes of the nation's largest and arguably most influential demographic group. You know, the millennials. In many sectors, corporate philanthropy and social responsibility are being turned into strategic and business necessities. Many women contemplate incorporating these practices into their current work life. Among UCLA graduates, consultants, and professors. You will hear from women with different experiences in this field who will reveal ideas, insights, and lessons learned from their involvement in working in, advising, or creating social conscious moment of welcoming our uh, moderator, Bhavna Savanan. She is the du executive director of Impact at Anderson at UCLA Anderson School of Management. Bhavna is the executive director, the school's faculty-led initiative to launch a new center for social impact and innovation at UCLA Anderson. In this role, Bhavna is responsible for establishing the vision and strategy for the new center, garnering financial resources and engaging with students, alumni, faculty, and impact professionals in the community. Previously, Bhavna managed impact measurement and business development for the Global Health Management and Leadership Programs at the Harold and Pauline Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. She holds an MPH from the University of Michigan and an MBA from UCLA Anderson. Her undergraduate degree in biology and psychology is from the University of Toronto. Bhavna is determined to show the world and MBA students that business can be a force for social change. So she is the perfect person to lead this um, panel discussion. Please help me give Bhavna a warm with a glad to be Thank you, Naomi. Um, it is really my honor today to be able to moderate this panel. Um, as you heard, we're starting a new center at Anderson with a goal of really showcasing how business can be a force for social change. This is my personal passion. I left public health because I felt like there could be, you know, better ways of impacting social outcomes bringing businesses into that fold. So this is really an honor for me to be able to speak to all these amazing minds here and learn about how each of them, in very different ways, are having a social impact. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Betsy Densmore, who has wears so many different hats and uh, is just an amazing person. She is the founding managing director of the Academies of Social Entrepreneurship, founder and advisor of the UCLA Social Enterprise Academy, also a partner at Social Venture Partners Los Angeles, and a founder of the Social Innovation Fast Pitch as well. So lots of hats, like I said, a uh, wonderful person. But what I'd like to do is actually have each person say a little bit about what you do. I think it'll just be easier for everybody to learn what you do that way. Okay. <clears throat> All right, then I'll turn my mic on. <laughs> I thought you were going down the line. Great. <laughs> just thought it'd make it more uh, right. interesting that way. Uh, OK. Hi. Uh, I think the best way to summarize what I do is that I have a, I have a passion for uh, the idea that arising that, that we should have we should lift all boats, and most of my work over the last ten years has focused on either has co focused on capacity building and on economic development in low and moderate income neighborhoods, and my strategies for doing that have been uh, creating these academies which teach 
which primarily teach leaders of nonprofit organizations how to create social businesses that will expand their impact as well as their income. Um, and then secondarily, working with micro enterprises that are usually being started by folks who, you know, like want a taco truck or want a want a, want a you know, small family business and have no clue about how to do that, which is really another form of social enterprise, in my view. Great. And then we have uh, Kelsey Orens, who is the Corporate Citizenship and Social Responsibility Specialist at Disney ABC Television Group. She has a BA in Political Science from UCLA as well. Kelsey, could you say a couple words about your role at Disney and maybe what motivates you every day working there? Absolutely. So as Bhavna said, my name is Kelsey. I work in Corporate Social Responsibility at Disney ABC Television Group. So most of my role involves activating all of our shows and platforms that have to do with TV to get into you as the viewers' heads, hearts, and minds. We have a goal of inspiring kids, families, and communities to be inspired to create a brighter tomorrow. It's very Disney. We embrace it at the television group. Um, and I'd say the most motivating part of my job is that I know everything that we work on touches millions of people. So it definitely raises the stakes and keeps us moving forward. Wonderful. And then we have Anne Wang, uh, co-founder. Did I say that right? Yeah. Sorry. Co-founder and CEO of Enru and also a UCLA undergrad, a BA in international development. So Anne, could you, I actually own one of your original wooden bowls um, awesome. from a couple of years ago. I love hearing that. And so I would love to have you share what Enru is and why you created the company, what the mission of the company is. Yeah, so I actually started a company when I was an undergrad here at UCLA. Um, the company is called Enru. And pretty much what we do is we source home goods and accessories from developing communities all over the world. So the idea is really empowering artisans that typically live below the poverty index line through employment by selling amazing content and product to consumers. And a lot of them are millennials here in the US. So um, my passion has always been looking at how do we activate mass uh, movements through great business models that can inspire consumers to actually impact global challenges. And a lot of what we do is not expect people to do good in their day to day, but to really utilize inspiration, great brand, great content, great product to move people to be inspired to do good and have it be in their day to day in a very accessible way. Um, so yeah, we've, we've done a ton of um, support in terms of programs with UCLA. We did Startup UCLA. I was a student at Betsy's when I was a senior. So a lot of that mentality around why we focus on moving um, people through content came heavily from my experience here at UCLA. Great. And last but not least, we have Angelia Trinidad, CEO and founder of Passion Planner and also UCLA undergraduate with a BA in art. So I actually own a passion planner. So these are not paid product endorsements, I swear. I really enjoy these companies. Um, so I know that I'm probably not your target demographic, but if you could share what a passion planner is and why you started that business. Um, so yeah, I graduated from UCLA in 2012 with um, a BA in art, which is really funny because people are like, art, what are you going to do with that? But I really feel like my, um, my education in art really helped me think project-based when it came to starting this business. So. What business is, I think, is a problem comes up, you find a solution, you solve the solution, you reflect on the problem, and then you move on. So for me, what I had faced after I graduated from UCLA was I had no idea what I wanted to do next. And I feel like every millennial that graduates, well, I feel like so many people feel that same way, and I wanted to make a tool that helped people figure that out. So I created Passion Planner, which is a planner that helps you define your long and short-term goals on paper, and then break them down to steps, and then incorporate those steps into your life. So, and then at the end of each month, you have monthly reflections. So it's pretty much you're creating your own syllabus because I know that so many people really thrive on structure, but after you graduate, that structure is not there. So how I started the company was I actually launched on Kickstarter, which is um, an online platform where you post your project online and you ask for funding. And we've done five Kickstarters in the past three years and we've raised $1.6 million just on Kickstarter from I think 60,000 people all across the world. So it's pretty crazy to think about like how that was successful and how it was was because we gave things away. The PDF is available to download for free no matter if you're able to afford it or not. And um, now for every planner we sell, we give one away because I feel like this is a product that can change someone's life very easily. So, yeah. Wonderful. 
And I wanted to take a moment to have you listen to each of their stories because I think what it highlights is just how broad and diverse social impact careers can really be. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get a sense from the audience. So how many people here would consider yourselves social impact professionals? Okay. And how many people are looking to transition into a social impact career? And how many people just enjoy social impact extracurricularly? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, there's really so many ways of being involved, and one of the things that we're promoting at Anderson with our MBAs in terms of thinking about social impact is to think about your area of impact, if you do want to specialize and move into it as a career or practitioner, and that could be health, education, energy, it's really the cause that you're passionate about, and then your vehicle of impact, so is it impact investing, social entrepreneurship, public-private partnerships, corporate giving, how are you really going to make a difference on your cause? So that might be an interesting way to think about it for those of you that are looking to move into the career um, as we move forward with conversation. So to kick off, I wanted to actually talk about, so actually I read recently that, and I did not know this, millennials are actually defined as 20 to 36, which I did not know. Um, so I uh, just barely made the cutoff there, but um, of not being a millennial. Just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> clarify. Um, so my question to all of you actually is social innovation, social impact, social entrepreneurship, pro-social business, the thing that we know by many names, um, is that becoming more mainstream? And if you think it is, is that driven largely by millennials living global lives wanting to you know, have a world impact or are there other forces involved for the change? You better. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so I guess I will start. Um, I really think that it's driven by how marketing has changed. Um, I feel like millennials are hypersensitive to being like, if you, if you try to sell them a product, millennials will push away. So what really has pushed millennials to purchase things is by true, real vulnerability when it comes to knowing the, usually the CEO story. So it's creating a connection with the person that is benefiting from this business that I feel like is driving. So that might be the community that is impacting, or it might be the idea that, that people are connected to because they identify with that idea closely. And I think that that is shifting how marketing is done, that I feel like so many larger companies are trying to find this genuineness in their marketing, but it, they're doing it retroactively instead of in the reverse way which I feel like is really, I think it's a challenge for a lot of different companies. For example, um, I've been working, at, well, I w spoke at the Women's Conference for Morgan Stanley, and one of their issues is appealing to millennials and being able to shift how millennials are going to invest their money because millennials don't want to be told where to put their money. They want to have, agent have a sense of agency of where to put it and know that it's going towards something bigger and better for like the grander like good, which I feel like a lot of people, when looking at older models of business, that wasn't a factor. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a huge thing that's shifting. Right. And yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I do think millennials are having a big influence. I do think that they, um, you know, they, they they have a huge commitment to having the world be left better than they found it. But I also think baby boomers are driving these trends speaking as a baby boomer, because um, I think we all, and, and, and I think although everybody's very excited about the millennial population and it is now the biggest, the baby boomers have more money mm -hmm. and we're the ones who have to figure out uh, about impact investing and about how to, you know, what kind of legacy we want to leave. And I think that that's driving many of us to embrace these concepts. Mm -hmm. and, and some of us are in second careers embracing those concepts, right. quite a lot of us, because a lot of us are going to live a lot longer than our parents did. Right. So I think that's part of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we really looked at, similarly, not only the marketing side, but looking at priorities for millennials. I think in past generations, at this age, a lot of people prioritize quality and price as number one purchasing reasons. Now, it's not necessarily they're buying for social good or they're buying for social innovation. They're buying more for emotional, experiential connection to what mm -hmm. they're buying. So it's about this vulnerability, but it's about an authenticity and needing to feel like you have this real alignment with what you're spending your money on. You're right, we don't have as much money as baby boomers. Mm -hmm. 
by far, but that also means that we're a little bit more careful about what we're putting our money into, which I think drives us to align values heavily with what we're buying. And so I do think that there is a huge momentum in it. I do think that they're driving um, great brands, both small startups to massive brands to think about how this alignment of values is going to react you know, in their content or in their um, product itself. But I will also say that I don't think millennials, as much as people think, are waking up in the mornings and buying products because of social good. I yeah. still think it is price, it is quality, but it's more so about experiential why for yourself. And it just happens that with the global market and with kind of the experiential side that it's moved towards more of a social impact. Mm -hmm. um, so we've really learned that lesson and we've been really careful, especially working with other socially innovative brands and mentioning, you know, the purchasing habit is not purely based on are you doing good or not. Hmm. But it's a huge it's a huge driver mm -hmm. of that emotional content. Right. Yeah. I mean it's interesting because I'm curious how much I think we, we, people that are in social impact tend to speak to others and are attracted to others that are also working in the social impact space. You know, but if you were to watch a show like Shark Tank, it would seem like the bottom line and the single bottom line of profitability is the only thing that matters to Mr. Wonderful and anybody else on that show, right? So I guess my question also is, is it, how easy is it and is it possible for a business to truly do both, be profitable and be about some social cause and or are there trade-offs and you know potentially were there trade-offs in the decisions that you made I'd say so I can take that mm -hmm. um, Shark Tank is an ABC show or runs on our <laughs> ABC network <laughs> like produced by Sony <laughs> <laughs> and the sharks have very charitable hearts um, <laughs> I think it's certainly possible to drive the bottom line and be socially good at the same time. I think that it's a, it's a long game and it's a matter of convincing the other business professionals in your workplace, in your greater network, that it's important for more reasons than the cause itself. And I think that we all as people who are invested in social impact already know that being a business that does good leads to doing well because the consumer, maybe not a purchaser, but someone who turns something on their television or um, decides on where they want to take a vacation, they want to know that that company is doing something good with that revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think that people, you know, let their kids watch Disney Channel because they trust Disney. Um, I think that that's a broader conversation. But in general, I would say it's certainly possible to do both, but it's a matter of selling the people around you on that idea and creating opportunities to drive the bottom line with the social good comp components of things. Yeah, I think that's really, I mean, and obviously my comment about that was really just about there is still a lot of convincing that I think what you mentioned mm -hmm. is that has to be done in terms of the long, the long game. Um, sorry, go ahead. Well, and, and it's a continuum. I mean, right. there, there are, there, all businesses can be more socially responsible, mm -hmm. I think. It, and, uh, and I think what you're going to hear over and over from us is that there's a lot of momentum for all businesses being more socially responsible. Right. Um, there's, there's a whole section in this month's Harvard Business Review, which I don't usually have the luxury of reading, but I was on a plane <laughs> with a long wait, and it was all about the, the, you know, lots of reasons why large companies are taking more seriously that they have to go for the long game, as you say. Um, distinct are the businesses which are solely social purpose businesses, um, which are the kinds of things I've worked with, and those are more commonly, commonly less profitable, but can be prof. I would say can be profitable, but often make sacrifices in terms of profitability in order mm -hmm. to solve, you know, get mosquito nets under every tree or um, take care of shoes. Right. We have, we have many examples. So then, along those lines, I'm curious. Um, you know, why would somebody choose to? work for a pro-social business, for-profit business versus a non-profit entity? And if you have any thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like with my, just knowing a lot of friends that have worked for the non-profit sector, it's always this issue of trying to find funding. And that becomes a huge 
hurdle that they have to constantly overcome that I feel like if you can create a product that can sell that benefits people people are going to act in their own self-interest and that's how you generate income but for example if someone has no buy-in into your nonprofit there's probably no way unless they have excess funds that they're going to give your company any money but if you make a product even if it's a very simple product that people like for example like the thing that helps you live on your shoes like millions billions potentially of those things have been sold and it right. makes literally it helps you with two seconds of your life if you're able to make a product but I feel like in terms of being like a uh, smart like a smart social business person, you have to think about, is this product making a better impact than it's offsetting in terms of using resources? Because there's a lot of BS products that you can make that are very gimmicky, that you can sell online and make it viral, but how about all the resources that you're gonna be using to make that product? Is it really that important to make a different brand of shirt that has a cool logo on it? Like, I don't know, I feel like it's easy, I, I guess for me as an entrepreneur, I feel like it's very easy for me to generate money, but it's like what product do I feel like will make a better, a grander impact than what I'm taking from the earth? And I think that that's super important in terms of like thinking about a sustainable company. Because if I think about my product in terms of Passion Planner, I feel like if it can help people get out of depression, if it can help people understand why they're feeling what they're feeling, and if it can be like someone's best friend without even having to be a person, I think that is worth, sorry, the tree that you know had to suffer from having this product. So I think that it's our responsibility as entrepreneurs to think about what our impact of our product is on a very like start to finish kind of basis. Right. And really, I think, sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, and I would just really quickly add, I come, our business, um, you know, we incubated here. A lot of people asked us, are you going to be a nonprofit or for-profit? We clearly, clearly decided to be for-profit because we wanted our artisans around the world to feel like they could build profitable businesses, so we really had to stand for that. Mm -hmm. That was an easy decision. The other thing that we really decided is we went out to the world in terms of tech investors as a profitable company that had a great idea and a great business. And the cherry on top was that we were changing the world yeah. to be a better place. I think that that has to be how the new future, the new like generation of social businesses have to be thinking about their customer, their product, number one. Are they going to be competitive against all the other products out there? And then have that cherry on top be about customer loyalty. I mean, I can't tell you how much our mission drives repeat customer buying, which when you present that to an investor and you're beating all the other e-commerce companies because of that, that on itself does not need convincing that you're going to be a sustainable business. So, you know, we've gone out and, and raised money from the number one tech investors. You know, we pitched at Forbes 30 under 30. We won that competition. We got investors from Troy Carter and, and very traditional investment mm -hmm. because they believed in the mission as a great business and the mission, of course, as our impact, but more so from a bottom line perspective where both revenue and impact are growing on the same trajectory. Um, so if you put more capital into this company, you're going to get more revenue, but you're also going to make more product or more impact through through selling or, or your business as a whole. So I think it's changing. I think that the conversation around investors looking at businesses is definitely changing, but I think it's how you present yourself as a social impact company. And I think that's really interesting, too, because one of the things we're definitely, you know, with Impact at Anderson, um, our goal is to be sector agnostic and industry agnostic to really emphasize that impact occurs and is you require all the sectors to have impact. And I think maybe the density of the kinds of organizations that exist within each of those might change in the next decade. But, you know, I think there's something to be said about you do need, there's, you know, probably bottom, bottom of the pyramid that is not a marketable population, a market-based solution may not work for that population, and so you do need a nonprofit or a government intervention to address that population, but for most other segments of the population, there could be a market-based solution that could work. Um, I wanna dig a little bit deeper, and maybe specifically, Betsy, with, you know, I think what you do with nonprofit organizations and social enterprises is really get them to understand the core of what they're trying to do in three minutes of a pitch, right? So you've probably seen, I feel like you've probably seen 
so many different types of nonprofits and social enterprises that have come through the gamut. Mm -hmm. What have you noticed? Are there certain types of revenue generating social enterprises that tend to be more successful than others? And are there certain types of nonprofit organizations that tend to be more successful than others? Okay, right. So first, just, um, so the term social enterprise as I use it is a business which is, uh, which is uh, socially focused if it's usually within a nonprofit organization and it is, and what it means is that there, someone is selling a product or service that is mission related in order to generate additional money as well as hopefully expand their impact. And um, yeah, I've worked, I think I'm working on about 300 at this point. And the, one of the things that I'm really happy about is that I think the best known social enterprises are, are nonprofit organizations that are workforce development organizations. So they employ their clients, give their clients job training and or a first job um, Chrysalis and Homeboys being two really great examples in Los Angeles um, and in that way get them back to work and they're also generating income. Um, we need those. They're the best known and the best developed but we have also, I mean we just, at this, in the Social Enterprise Academy which we just finished here on the UCLA campus where we worked with 10 nonprofit organizations, we have a Boys and Girls Club that's going to start a driver school. We have a theater that's going to start marketing to uh, has, has be, while preserving their mission and their purpose, is, is going to look, uh, connect with corporate clients who need help with their message to uh, primarily low-income communities. Um, we have uh, uh, a, a, are they graduates? Is Youth Movement Against Alzheimer's a graduate of Startup too? Okay, but another, uh, another organization founded by UCLA students uh, is is providing services to Alzheimer's families. Um, so, I mean, it, the, we had we had a winner a year or so ago that came up with a product line of clothing for cancer survivors because they were a cancer information center. And, and the point of all these businesses is that they reduce the dependence of the organization on donations. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, they give them another way to make friends and make a difference in whatever their area of focus is. And it's, it is inspiring and it is remarkable how many ideas there are out there if you can, you know, if you take the time to really do the homework. I, I've never found, an, I've never worked with an organization where we haven't come up with something that made sense. Even if it doesn't solve their budget problems, it at least takes a bite out of the need to always have your hand out. And in all the advising that you've done, has there been certain type of advice that's harder to give and harder to receive and implement? Yes. Um, echoing my colleagues to the left, um, I think our biggest challenge is getting people to do the, is, is, to, to, is making sure that people do their homework regarding what customers really want. So doing market research. Because, and I think that's a real problem. I think that's actually a bigger problem in the, um, social sector and the not-for-profit community because I think sometimes people get really excited about solving a problem and the problem they think they're solving is not really being experienced by enough people for it to be worth starting the organization. Mm -hmm. You kind of, um, and that sometimes that bleeds into people's ideas about social enterprises. Mm -hmm. Right, I think nonprofit organizations may have a tough time thinking of their population as customers in order to yes, do that analysis, that's right. That's right. That's, right. that's yeah. one of the Actually, there are a lot of paradigm shifts in the work we do, and that's one of them. Another is uh, getting people over the idea that profit is a dirty word. Right. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> and honestly, I feel like a lot of, at least artists, and ev like women artists, feel guilty for selling their work. Yeah. And it's like, you did the work, you should be paid for it. Like, there are so many of my friends that are artists that will do art for free, and I'm like, if you were a dentist, and someone wanted to get a cavity filled, you would charge them. You wouldn't feel bad about like expecting to be paid. Like that that doesn't make sense. I feel like so many women specifically have such a strange relationship with money that it feels it's very guilty for them to make money. That it's like something that we really need to disconnect with because it shouldn't be associated with guilt. Because I feel like money to me is a tool. It's a tool to enable you to make decisions to uh, create freedom, but a lot of women see it as this guilty, this thing that they shouldn't, they shouldn't use or they shouldn't like capitalize on. 
or if they do, then they are being manipulative, which I'm like, it doesn't make sense because if you're constantly worrying about money, you can never be worrying about like what impact you can make. And I feel like, I feel like with artists, for example, like artists, there's the, the idea of having a starving artist is so prevalent because artists don't know how to sell their product to their, because they don't want to be, they don't want to be sellouts. And I'm like, well, you need to be able to pay for your housing. You need to be able to pay for food. And if you don't do those two things, you can never even make work. So you have to be able to get over the fact that money isn't a bad thing. And to get paid, especially get paid at high amounts, that is what you deserve and you will get what you ask for. Like Oprah, my, one of my favorite quotes is, you, you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. The reason why someone has been paid a million dollars for a painting is because they asked for a million dollars, not because someone looked at it and was like, that's worth a million dollars, let me go write you a check. No, they put the price, a million dollars, and they said, I'm not gonna sell it unless someone wants to give me a million dollars. And I mean, the art community, and like, ugh, I could talk extensively about <laughs> like art and politics and when it comes to that, and about how, okay, then you get your friend to write about you, and usually it's a male, a white male to write about you, and then you get really high ratings on your work, and then you can sell it. And I'm like, and then when they see all that, the happening, then they don't want to be a part of the industry. And I feel like it's really interesting because art and business have such, and entertainment. My, one of my best friends, Nikki Suhu, she's right here, she's an actress. And it's like, there's so many uh, parallels between all these things of women just being treated like lesser. And I mean, that's something that we all have felt in different situations. And for me, I'm an Asian woman and I'm young. Like, I look like I'm 18. <laughs> like, and for me, I feel like my intelligence is never seen as something right off the bat. I have to earn it. I have to sit here and talk and like explain to people how much money I've made. And then I get, you know, what they want, what they're like, people, what I said earlier was like, people are motivated by their own self-interest. When they start to understand that you could be a beneficial to them, that's when it kind of shifts, which I feel is really interesting because it's like, when you get to that point, you need to be able to be like, okay, yeah, I'll mentor you, but I will, it'll cost because let's say, uh, what's his name? Tony, Tony Robbins, like if you're gonna meet with him, it's probably like a grand, at least an hour. But how many women would feel comfortable to say, hey, you wanna sit with me for an hour and you're gonna pay me a grand? Like I feel like almost all the women in this room would be like, that's way too much money. Okay, I'll sell it for like 50 bucks. And it's like, what? Like, no, well, like, like no, yeah. you're worth and ask for it. I think that's well, I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting point that you bring up because you know, definitely there is a rhetoric of, you know, I think we all know that women tend to be drawn to purpose-driven careers more so. Um, you know, we see it in admissions for Anderson as well. Um, more women writing about social impact and business for social change. But there's also this understanding and, and research that's been done about women feeling like if they're doing something good for the world, then you're right. Like, they shouldn't necessarily be, you know, compensated for it. And I don't know. I mean, it's it's definitely, I think, nonprofit social impact is a very female-dominated industry right now. It may shift. And I'm curious if it does shift and it does become more equal, if there is a good representation of men and women, if the salaries, if the if the compensation all go up as well, especially, you know, the idea of nonprofit organizations right now typically don't get, I mean, it's changing, but the funding for operations tends to be limited and it tends well, to have yeah. to be more direct program, but you can't run a program if you don't have money for operations. So or if you don't have really the idea to ask for it. Like right. women are not, most women are not, I have 20, 32 people that work for me now and they're all around my age, most of them. And the women don't ask for raises. I have to be like, you need to, do you think you deserve raises? I have to, <laughs> millennials in general don't know how to ask for what they want because they feel already that they're entitled. They already feel like they're given handouts all the time. And I'm like, you earn this. You're doing work that people that are like way older than you are, could be doing. You're creating results that I feel like, pe but people are uncomfortable to ask. And I feel like, especially minorities, they feel uncomfortable. That they're like, I already have it good, I don't want it to be better. And it's the people that ask for it, the people that are gonna get it. And I feel like there needs to be this idea of confidence building to the, especially for women and minorities, um, 
to ask for what you want because that's what I that's how I created the company that I run right. I literally went on camera and was like hi I'm making this product and I'm gonna make a planner and would you like to give me money so I can make this product and that's how it happened I asked millions of complete strangers and I feel like if you can't even do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if we don't empower our youth, our kids, our like fellow millennials to be able to ask for what they want, then we're always going to follow in everyone else's footsteps. And right. That's what's kind of happening. So sticking with the idea of starting your own business and taking a risk, and I want to turn to you about um, when did you identify that purpose was important for you um, in whatever that you, whatever you did. And how did you stick with that purpose when there were probably, you know, I'm a first children of first generation immigrant, you've written that you are as well. And have there been other pressures and how have you stuck with the purpose through your business? Yeah, I mean, I think I was really lucky to have early inspirations as a teenager that I, similarly as most millennials, felt like a huge part of my identity was around what my purpose was in terms of a larger global community. So I've always had that. It was always an innate part of my personality. So I worked heavily with Charity Water and Invisible Children. Um, if you are a millennial, you probably have heard of one or two. Um, and so th then I came into UCLA and I studied International Development Studies, which no offense to that is in some ways a basket weaving major as some people see, because it's, it's a very unique uh, major but it was something I knew I've always wanted to do. So purpose was never a priority that was on a yes or no uh, list ever. It was always one of the top priorities for me. So when I looked at my career and I said, oh yeah, you know, I, I could go and work in government, I could work at a great nonprofit, I could work for the UN, I had already had built great relationships in this space, I could go to Rwanda and work for years. I really, really felt like there were so many frustration studying what I did around great impact and what was out on the market in terms of what could make an impact. So for me, it was heavily about looking at impact and purpose as the why and building the model that could solve some of those key issues, which was how do we create a business that really focuses on employing and empowering people on an individual level and then also using something that already exists out there, which is mass consumption as a catalyst force. So again, it wasn't ever like uh, compromisable. And I always said that to all my investors and I said that straight up to all of my team, everybody is the reason why we're here is not necessarily to be the next big founder, the next big tech company, the next big unicorn. It's because we truly believe in our mission. And if that mission ever is compromised, this company is no longer in room. And that has to be on the table no matter who we talk with. So it just, became a priority and it just became a huge conversation at the beginning of any relationship that we went into. Um, so yeah, I mean, as a similarly Asian, young, you know, uh, individual, I think you walk into a room, especially with investors that see a lot of people come through, a little bit disadvantaged, but I really think that coming in as an underdog has helped me a lot. Because I walk out of that room feeling or I walk into that room feeling like I have so much to bring to the table and I'm going to be so incredibly memorable because they haven't seen me before and I think they're going to be a little bit blown away with what I have to show. Right. And that work, the work itself, speaks heavily for my purpose and the savviness of my business and the savviness of what energy comes from being driven by a purpose um, that I think is very different than most tech mm -hmm. startups. And what do you think is a is maybe the hardest thing about running your own business right now? Oh, I mean, there's so many things. No, I mean, I think especially in purpose-driven jobs, careers, companies, anything, burnout is a very real thing. And like, as much as you think about capital funds being, uh, you know, limit and boundary, you know, all of these like social issues. The really the biggest thing for me has been when you are so purpose driven and when your team is so purpose driven, everything becomes sacrificed. And that includes like personal health, team health, um, you know, time to really nourish the, the driving force of the company, which is the, the people and the team. Um, so that is a big challenge for me. And I think when I have younger social entrepreneurs come and you know, ask me for advice, that's the number one thing is 
you really have to think about you as being the number one gladiator and tool for your purpose. So make sure you really input time into personal team and culture. Because um, as you probably know, if you work in social good, everything else comes first and that can really actually hurt your end goal um, when the team is not aware of that. Compassion fatigue of some sort, working yeah, on a mean, purpose. I think all of us would probably say work-life balance right. of some sort. Right, yeah. Right, I, I mean, making sure you bake in time to take care of yourself and your right. people, because otherwise, yeah. Oh, that's I mean, I, you know, one of the one of one of the unpleasant realities of my last ten years is that I've had two two colleagues um, drop out, you know, like fall from the field out with uh, serious depression, which yeah. I think was stress related. Yeah. And I mean, I think we could have a whole panel on yeah. the amount of depression that is around that we're not necessarily being responsible for, but I think it shows up more here, and it's yeah. Um, really sad and really scary. I mean, I think somebody somebody mentioned that it's sort of um, social entrepreneur working uh, in India said that they every day he goes to bed depressed because he sees how much more need there is and yeah, how little right. he's actually impacting but that But clearly need. that's what happened to these two colleagues. Right. They just got overwhelmed by yeah. what they couldn't do. So let's uh, cheer up by talking about yeah. Disney a little yes. bit. Like, uh, yeah, sorry, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah, no. It's not what I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. So Kelsey, has purpose been your driver for your career and how did you get to where you are? Because I'm sure some people in the audience are curious about that yeah. as well. Absolutely. Um, similarly to what Anne was saying, purpose has always been a non-negotiable for me. I actually found an article from my local newspaper when I was a high school graduate that had like a little one paragraph summary and it asked me what I would hope was my future in 10 years. And the final sentence was, Kelsey hopes to continue spreading love and acceptance to all of those around her. <laughs> so it's been, <laughs> yes, so that's been the driving force of everything I've wanted to do. I think I wouldn't be able to give something my all if I didn't truly believe it had some kind of greater purpose beyond me and my microcosm or something that I was selling or doing. There had to be some kind of greater impetus for the work that I would put into something in order to pursue it. So I studied political science, global studies, and civic engagement at UCLA, and definitely thought I was going the law politics route. I worked for the LA Superior Court as in a legal self-help center, which kind of to the depression drain, I think was, I realized was not for me. Um, I also worked at a private law firm, not for me either. I had a great experience working for Senator Dianne Feinstein in her office here in Los Angeles, and then went to Washington DC and worked for a think tank. And that's where I really honed in on my passion for corporate social responsibility and learned what it was. It was, it's still new now, it was even newer back then. Um, I was working on a project on US leadership in development, so how the United States private sector invests in developing economies, and the project was funded by the Chevron Corporation, which I found interesting. It was kind of their CSR footprint, and I was like, why is this gas and oil company suddenly caring about these developing economies? But it was my first exposure to CSR in practice, and that was how that business justified their what they were taking from those communities. So that was my first foray into that, and I came back, LinkedIn job searching was not very helpful at that point in time, so I was Googling corporate social responsibility in Los Angeles and found Disney, and I interned there and then started working full-time after I graduated. So purpose has been very central. I just didn't know that social enterprise, social innovation, social good and business was an option until I had kind of evolved through my career search soul searching process of sorts. Um, but I do feel from the rest of my experiences and the other people who I've been able to network with in my current role, that Disney's social footprint is truly genuine. And I think that's one of the most motivating parts of working there is that I know my colleagues, even those who don't work in corporate social responsibility, believe in this part of the business and feel good about working here because they know that all of us on the eighth floor are working toward these bigger and better projects. That's inspiring for sure. So um, I'm going to pause and I think we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions. Uh, we have a microphone, a couple microphones, I think. I know that as a really old millennial, otherwise known as a hippie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 
I become more and more conscious through my life of not only looking for socially conscious companies to support, but I think more in my consciousness is the companies that I wish to avoid. And I haven't heard any of you reference the flip side of that coin and what are those of us to do who truly love a product, a company, whatever, and then we find out something about their workers, their environment, their corporate culture, their politics, and we no longer feel like we can enjoy their product. I mean, I think the question is very difficult. It's something that in the conscious consumption space is highly debated in terms of how much we as conscious companies should push for our consumers to really change their lifestyles. And I think out of all of the communications and you know research that we've done, it really just comes down to personal priorities because it's impossible to be, impossible to be 100% consciously impactful in your day to day. It just, at this point in time, it just is. Every single action has a ripple effect and a part of that is going to be negative. So I really think it's about putting a priorities down for yourself that are non-negotiable things. If you will not support any companies that work with child labor, go through all of your companies that you, that you, that you shop with and, and just drop them. There are alternatives most of the time now. There are lots of brands out there. Um, but I think that sometimes people get really overwhelmed with that decision and feel like they can't do anything, so they just give up and, do, and, and shop everywhere and anywhere. But it's just about making that decision for yourself and saying, I'm going to do my part as best as I possibly can and make those decisions for yourself. You know, for me, working in conscious consumption, the first three years I, did, I was working on Enru, I didn't buy like one item. And, and I was just, I can't buy that, I can't do this, like there's all these impacts. And at the end of the day, it, it definitely worked, but it is not sustainable for everybody. Um, and so you have to sit down and just make those decisions and be educated. I think that's the most important thing. And then, you know, the secondary most important thing to that is people forget how much social capital they have in influencing their friends. That's more impactful than not doing something on your own. It's about getting 15, 20 people to do impactful things that can make a much bigger ripple effect, even if it's a one decision on a one topic um, versus everything. If it's animal testing, do it and talk about it and inspire the people around you to do the same. There's also, um, I, I think, a really great new resource for all of us is VLab. Which is, um, which, is, which is an organization that has basically created a, uh, a set of standards and a set of standards for companies and, and online tests that those companies can take to evaluate the degree to which they are being socially responsible about the way they treat their employees, about where they source their products, about how they treat their customers, and about how they're being in relationship to the environment. And, um, they, they, if you're a company who wants to uh, stand up for those kinds of standards, you can get yourself certified as a B Corporation. And at this point, they're probably going on 2,000 companies. It's still pretty small relative to the number of companies there are, but it's a great model and I think it's helping. And even if you, um, it's, it's a great place to just go look and see what sorts of things should companies be thinking about. Even if, I mean, I, you know, I haven't, you have to be a for-profit company, and um, not everybody. It doesn't make sense for every company to do it, but it's a, it's a, it is a place to look for companies you want to support proactively. And just the one thing that I'll add on that is I think we forget oftentimes that communication with companies has changed. Like, it's really two-way dialogue right now. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to communicate directly with a brand that you have been loyal to that is not doing something that you like. You know, there's so many avenues through social media, and I think that's really been some of the impetus for the change for big businesses as well, in that they've been getting direct consumer feedback, which in a way that they never had before. I mean, there was a customer service line before, right? Now, literally, American Airlines loses your luggage, they get a tweet about it, right? So it's a public shaming mechanism that's been created yeah, yeah. that I think brands are afraid of. So there's that as well. That's good. Other questions? 
Betsy, following up on your comment a little bit, one of the things um, both Bob and I spent a little bit of time on is metrics, and I'm wondering if um, you all can share some of the metrics that you use or that your funders have imposed upon you to measure your social impact. Um, in the case of the work I do with nonprofit organizations, the outcomes we keep our eye on are primarily, are they, do they start a social enterprise? Does it generate revenue? Um, and does it last more than two years? Which beats the norm of most small businesses. Um, beyond that, there's the softer data of all the feedback we get about how it alters the way the leaders of the organization think of themselves and has them being much more business-like and creative. But, but for rock solid, this is why I should stay in business, it's uh, how much money gets made, really. Uh, does a business is is the business successfully started and does it help produce discretionary income for the nonprofit? Um, and just to jump in, we uh, defined our metrics as hours of dignified work we were creating, mm. and also bringing that to the customer. So when you go on the site, you can find a wooden bowl. Um, you can meet the maker uh, on our site of that particular product and you can also see when you click and add to your bag, that's how many hours of work you're creating for that person. On the TV side, we look at metrics um, specifically with our grantees. Every time that we make a substantive grant to a nonprofit, they're expected to deliver on certain metrics which are specific to the program that we funded or the organization that we're working with. And then additionally, we've partnered with universities and um, family foundations to study specific episodes where we've integrated pro-social topics into storylines to see if viewership increases, decreases, if we have a more or less engaged viewer when we're talking about a social issue. And so far, the research has supported um, deeper engagement in content when we're talking about something hot in the pro-social space. I was like, yeah, okay. I think for a metrics for Passion Planner, it's like we've been in we've been in business now for three and a half years, and literally, if my first year I was in my parents' garage selling like in the whole year like four thousand planners, and then overnight, I don't know, we probably sold, I think like maybe a hundred thousand over the course of one week when we went viral online. Um, so we jumped, I don't know how many per thousands of percent, like in terms of increase, but after, after year after year, we've grown at least 40, 50 percent year after year. And it's crazy because we literally spend nothing on marketing, like zero. We don't run any ads. We don't, we literally, it's just word of mouth. It's people saying, I've had a great experience with this product. It's really changed my life. I'm going to tell 10 of my friends. I'm going to gift it to them on their birthdays. I'm going to give it to them for Christmas. And it's literally that kind of like really good feeling of this product is really impacting people positively, and that's what's driving it to grow. Yeah. Hello, my name is Jennifer, and I'm in financial education. As a millennial <laughs> entrepreneur, uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge for you know for me there I'm taking on a really important leadership role when it comes to leading women into learning about finance or you know leading even men into taking care of their own finances what would you say was the most challenging as women young entrepreneur leaders in your field like what was the most challenging for you in like starting a company or in, in your, your in your situation of finance in your company in your, per, in your personal experience um, as an entrepreneur I think for me personally it was shifting from being very rigidly individualistic as an artist to having a team because I went from me and my two two of my really close friends helping me ship and answer emails to having 40 uh, people. Like I had to hire 40 people to do QC, to ship, to answer emails. We had 125,000 emails come in in one week. Like, holy <laughs> crap. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> my gosh, it was crazy. And also on top of that, the shipment um, was delayed from China for two months 
like, we'd run a planner company. These things are dated. <laughs> so <laughs> we had so much hate email. I had so many hate comments on my Instagram. And like, I couldn't even be on social media because I was going to get blasted. Um, but it was because of the port strikes that were happening along the West Coast during that year, which was which sucked. But anyways, I think it was that transition from me like being like, all right, yeah, I could kick it in my garage with my dog to being like I have to be in charge of not only the financial health but the me mental and like the mental health of my staff and being able to manage that and people people are so hard to manage <laughs> come on and I'm 20 at the time I was 23 like what <laughs> so I think it was that people are so hard to manage when yeah, you're in your damn, 40s and 50s <laughs> But I'm like, I'm taking a break. This, this week, honestly, is I told my staff, I'm not working. And I'm sitting here working. <laughs> like, yeah. You're reflecting. I'm reflecting, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, to be honest, it was, I didn't have that pivotal moment of like, this is the hardest. I didn't really make a decision. I just said, you know what, I think there's something to this idea. Let's just start running at it and kind of similarly like asking everyone, talking about it and just seeing if it sticks and something about it did stick. Um, I think managing people was the biggest growing that I had to do, especially as a younger female um, role that initially in early startups, I think there's something about being a peer-to-peer -peer with your early team, right? Like your friends, I, we hired our best friends. Oh, my best friend. Like yep. mm -hmm. amazing in terms of how hard everyone's gonna yeah. work, but then when you start becoming that larger leader figure, which you're not so much just driving passion and vision anymore, you're really needing to drive culture and objectives and operational needs, that was a really big growing, um, pain for me because I ended up going from this like vision of the company where people put so much of their personal identities into what our vision was and for me to come in and then be operational and be like hey you need to do this a little better or you need to you know manage that was really hard for the team to transfer into because the, that shift between who I ha was to them so as a female leader, I think it's really important that you do need to put up some boundaries around like your ability to lead a team well and what that means. Um, and it also, you need to know yourself really, really well as what type of leader you are and what type of support you need from a team. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And embracing both of those so that you can hire and really um, manage in the right way. Uh, that's something that I wish I would have learned a lot earlier because I think I learned through working and it took longer for me to get to that great kind of pinnacle of not there yet kind of thing of leadership, you know. Especially when you're experiencing it, I feel like there's so many emotions involved that it's like you can't just yeah. look at the situation and be like, that's the solution. Because you'll come to the solution and be like, that's the solution. But I feel like like you feel emotionally charged to it. I feel like for me, one of the biggest lessons I've had to learn with people is under promising and over delivering, especially with the people that work closely with me. Because right when you say, all right, next year, we're gonna get full benefits and you can't deliver, then you're, you're, you're you know, you're, you're screwed. Um, and it's just like, you can't do that. And for me, what I've learned is even though I'm super excited about something, I will not Cross, show my staff the bridge until we're ready to cross it. Mm -hmm. And the bridge is there. It's built, it's stable, we're ready to cross it all together. But if it's not, I will, I will write it down my planner and then like wait. that's, we'll wait. Yeah. Because people get so attached to expectation that even if, for example, I take my staff to Disneyland every <laughs> year that like um, they expect it now. And I'm like, this is, you guys are so lucky. You get to like take the day off. I pay you to go to Disneyland with me. Like, that's so crazy. But now it's an expectation. So being able to under promise and over deliver to not only your staff, but also your customer base is so important. If you tell your customers that it's gonna ship in February, but it ships literally the first day, March, then you're screwed. Like you just completely lost their trust and trust is the hardest thing to build with your clients. So again, like under promising, over delivering, never telling them a surprise until it's ready to go. That's like prime advice for everything. So. Mine is um, 
find a way to manage your, um, well, let me start it this way. I mostly, I've been, I've been managing people since I started my first business when I was 16. So I've been managing people pretty much my whole life. And I'm pretty good at it most of the time. And I have a pretty conciliatory style most of the time. Like on Myers-Briggs, you know, I'm the inclusive <laughs> sort. Yeah. But if things, if there's, if, if, if there is a crisis in the making or some big breakdown that I'm concerned about, then some of you may remember the character Hunk Ra in Doonesbury, who comes out of this nice, you know, sort of, ditzy blonde and is this like she warrior. Um, I, you know, I, I, can, I can go really nasty really quick and it throws people off in a big way. Um, so you may not have that character flaw, but I think you know, all of us have these places where we become someone other than who we want to be and knowing where that is in you and being able to catch yourself before you've done damage is, would be my advice. That's great advice. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Was there another Hi, sorry. I know we're running short on time, so thank you. I actually just had a really quick question for Kelsey. Um, I work for a Fortune 500 or a big corporate myself, and one of the first initiatives, and thank you ladies all for, for everything that you've provided here and being here tonight as well. One of the first initiatives that I took surprisingly in terms of leadership position there was to spread diversity and social impact in, in a completely different way from what I was hired to do um, in terms of using that as my community initiative. And my question to you was how much did Disney support or have barriers or was this already created or you just flew right into it and there were so much more ways to go or just how your impression was? Absolutely. So I think I'm, I was lucky to come into Disney at a time when these institutions within the business were already created. So we're lucky that we have a corporate social responsibility team separate from a public policy team, separate from diversity and inclusion teams embedded within each business. We have teams dedicated to each racial subset. We have groups dedicated to veterans, to LGBT, et cetera. We have ERGs, which are employee resource groups, completely separate from the business, but kind of like a side passion project where people will opt to be co-presidents together and put on programming, bring in speakers. So I think that's a great part about working for a massive company is that these things are you know, to like what we were saying, people have expectations that these things will be provided when they work at a company as large as Disney. Um, but I also have to say that when we have tried to do new things, we've had so much support across the board. And it's because, you know, even if you work in finance or sales, there's a special piece of your heart that has a passion for a social cause. So we have, my team is only three people at Disney ABC for the entire television group, but we have tripled that team with people on stretch assignment who have just kind of joined because they have a passion for a certain part of what we do and spend like 10% of their time with us. So I think even if your massive company doesn't offer that, you can offer yourself as a resource for your little niche that you think you have something to give. That's great. I want to thank you very, 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 very much. And on your chairs is this um, pamphlet and I know you weren't quite sure who you were going to meet tonight, but what an engaging panel and, and group of individuals. And I hope that you will take this home with you and the, you will go to their various websites and learn more about them, because I certainly am. I, I have a lot more to understand about, about what they're doing. I'd like to thank Bhavna uh, Sibanan for serving as the moderator. Betsy Densmore, Kelsey Orens, Angelia Trinidad, Ann Wong, and the staff from UCLA Anderson, Elaine Hagee, and Startups UCLA, uh, Deanna Evans. Um, I invite you all to continue having a cocktail in the back. And now that you know these uh, women a little better, please take the opportunity to ask further questions. And thank you so very, very much for joining us today and we have lots of reasons to celebrate those who go to UCLA. Thank you. <laughs>